everyone, Mario again, coming at you with another review. Today I'm reviewing a film that I first uh, heard of a couple years ago, and then I watched it once when it was on a movie channel. I enjoyed it, and been meaning to see it again, and it was on Netflix, so I'm like, eh, I'll give it a watch. It, of course, is the 1995 film that is a spin-off of the show Tales from the Crypt. It is Demon Knight. The film was directed by Ernest R. Dickerson and Gilbert Adler, and it stars Billy Zane, William Sadler, Jada Pickett-Smith, Thomas Hayden Church, C.C.H. Powder, eh, Pounder, excuse Pounder, yeah, Pounder, and of course, John Kasser as the voice of the Crypt Keeper. Hello, kitties! Kitties, or whatever, you know, you know what I mean, kitties. You know. I never watch a show, so... Now... How did I first hear about this film? Well, I heard about the sequel. Well, s sequel spinoff, Bordello of Blood first, but I never saw it all the way through. And then doing research, I'm like, Demon Knight. Hmm. Then one night flipping through channels, catch it. That's basically how I heard of it. Now, unlike the HBO series, the story was not ripped from the pages of EC Comics. The first draft of the script was actually written in 1987, which is actually two years prior to the show's debut. It was intended to be made into a film by Tom Holland, the guy who shot Child's Play, and it was going to be his follow-up. And he hired an FX team to do uh, sketches, but it ultimately never came to be. So he went to direct the box office bomb, Fatal Beauty. After that, the script wound up, wound up in the hands of the Pumpkinhead screenwriter, Mark uh, Carducci, who sat on it for several years before he gave it to uh, Pet Cemetery director, Mary Lambert. And uh, she had some radical ideas for the script... And of course, like casting an African American as a breaker to create a theme that the oppressed people of Earth were, to, were its, also its saviors, which I could say that would have been interesting to actually see, but we kind of get that with the ending that's already in the film. But would have been interesting. But once she directed Pet Cemetery 2, which of course was a theatrical bomb, she could not get people to invest in the film. It was like, oh, you want us to do this film? Weren't you the woman who directed Pet Cemetery 2? Yeah. Get the fuck out of here. Basically that. Next, it went to Full Moon Features, but budgets put it in limbo. And when it finally made its way onto the desk of Joel Silver's Silver Pictures, it was optioned to be the second in a trilogy of Tales from the Crypt films. And of course, Universal Studios executives thought the script had more potential than the other two, Dead Easy and Body Count, neither of which ultimately were produced, which it'd be nice to see them produced now, even if they were directed DVD films, but... Alas, move on. And the movie was put into production with a release date of Halloween 94, though it was originally, though afterwards it was pushed back to January 95, which... That's probably a bad idea. It made back its money, but it could have made more money. I mean, it was made for $12 million, which I will say, after watching the film, I could see that money up on the screen. But then it only made $21 million, which, considering that it was released in January, that's not surprising. That's the release, that's where they always put movies that always go to die. I mean, how many movies released in January become big, big hits? As far as I know, not that many. There's probably a few exceptions, but I think you get my point. Now, at this point, two versions of the script were created to solve budget problems. One with demons and one without. In the latter, the collector was a Bible salesman who was using a legion of fellow salesmen clad in black suits and sunglasses, who were later shown to be demons. And, of course, um, there was another film apparently called Demon Night with demons that looked like killer yuppies. So Universal pitched in some additional money to get the demons on the screen, which I could say it's a good thing they did because actually showing some demons that actually look like demons I think helps the film a little bit. You could have done the film without that, like just shown... The humanoid demons, I mean, our lead, lead bad guy is a humanoid demon, but as we find out later, he's like a top demon, whereas the other demons we see are lesser demons. So it would have worked, but I think it's a little bit better. Now, uh, what do I think of the film? I still enjoy the film. I think it's a very fun film. I have to agree with the audience ratings. Could be a little, I don't know if they could be higher or lower. I guess it's going to depend on who you ask. It has a 6.5 on IMDb, which I can see why that... As a 63% with the audience. And the uh, critical s critical score surprises me yet doesn't. 32% on Rotten Tomatoes. No consensus. When you watch the film, you can see why critics probably gave it that score. It's like, But then at the same time, you're like, 
what were you expecting? Were you expecting an Oscar-worthy film? You're watching a film called Demon Knight. They were probably expecting it to be, you know, big, big, because of the fact that it's under Tales of the Crypt. But then again, when you look up the production history, you should be like, ah, it wasn't specifically written for that. It just came into them. But still, despite that, I think it fits the Tales of the Crypt name, at least what I know of it. And it's a pretty good uh, theatrical film. And a good horror film. Like the show, though, it has book has bookends featuring the Crypt Keeper. Like the first one is him directing an episode of the TV series, and he's getting angry with the lead actor. You call that acting? And then, of course, the last one is him getting Final Cut. I'm not going to say what it involves, but... And then the middle part, of course, is our main story. Now, the story is that it takes place in New Mexico, but we only see that at the beginning. Uh, a drifter named Frank... Uh, Breaker is in is being chased by a pursuer called the Collector. Their vehicles crash and Breaker flees. He eventually meets the local drunk named Uncle Willie. He takes him to a decommissioned church that now serves as a local boarding house for a good portion of the townsfolk. There he rents a room and he observes the residents. The owner Irene, a prostitute named Cordella, a postal cl clerk named Wally, and a convict on work release named Geraldine. Now, of course, not that long afterwards, a man, uh, a cook named Roach arrives, and he's basically like a, you know, like a surfer dude type guy, at least in how he dresses. He doesn't have the dude, he doesn't have that voice, but he, in his appearance, he has the dress. He dresses like that, and of course, he mentions that someone just attempted to steal his boss's car, which we see earlier was Breaker, and a suspicious Irene calls the sheriff. The sheriff and his deputy arrive with the collector, who he can, who they convince him to arrest Breaker. And as they're trying to sort everything out, eventually the collector gets fed up with it and he kills one of the cops. Uh, Breaker gets out of the cuffs and using this artifact that's a key-like artifact that looks like it has something in it, forces the collector outside. And he gets mad now, so he calls upon his demon army to help take care of him. Uh, Breaker seals them in the house, and now they have to try to wait out the night. Because apparently the key that Breaker has is a very important artifact from the beginning of time. It has to do with how demons are not allow, allowed to fully work in the material world. That's basically the gist of it. And there are these keys that hold them back, but if they get all seven, they can break through it. They don't tell you everything, they just tell you enough about it that you need to know, which I think works. Because one of those things that some of it's probably best left to the imagination. But of course, you can kind of figure what's in the thing, so it's not a spoiler, it is blood. And I thought that was interesting. It's kind of very religious, especially when you go with the Judeo-Christian tradition. Especially considering that the blood that was in it originally was the blood of Christ. Literally! Not just some wine. It literally was the blood of Christ, which you do see that a little bit in a short flashback. Now, uh, all the stuff that happens during the night, I'm not really going to go into, but you can imagine, a lot of it is believable, like how them wanting to get out of there at first... <laughs> them not trusting Breaker for the longest time, and then, you know, scoffing a little bit when he tells them exactly what's going on, and then, of course, he has to even refute it. I didn't make these rules, okay? And then, of course, even later in the film, the collector does this, like, I didn't make, I guess he didn't tell you the rules, I didn't make them up either. You know, stuff like that. And, uh, like I mentioned before, we don't learn everything. Some stuff is better left unsaid. Mostly it's the, uh, stuff involving the demons and Breaker and the other people that held this artifact. And even uh, a lot about what it was stuff was like before it. We just know that there were demons. Which, of course, if you know the Judeo-Christian tradition and all that, you should probably guess a little bit probably what it was. But it's like, hmm, that would have been interesting if it had more money to actually show some of that stuff, but it's unnecessary. Exposition works just fine. Like, you know, better in your mind. Uh, now, if, uh, the directing, I thought, was done pretty well. Apparently, the main director was Ernest uh, Dickerson, which I thought he did a good job. Uh, apparently, Adler, it just says it says mostly on his filmography page that he was the producer, but he probably did, like, second unit and maybe, like, some uh, some reshot stuff. But I thought he did a good job, and he was also a writer on the show, so I guess that's why he was on it. He directed the follow-up, Bordello of Blood, and... According to this, that was the only movie he ever directed. Every, everything under that, other than that, is producer. Like he was a producer for Thirteen Ghosts, House on Haunted Hill, Ghost Ship. 
He was the executive producer on Starsky and Hutch and Constantine. Oh, he was one of the producers for Superman Returns. And, he, and the last thing, according to this, he produced was Dylan Dog, Dead of Night. As for Dickerson, uh, this was his third film. His first one was a movie called Juice. After this, he directed Bulletproof, which... If I'm thinking right, I think this is the one that one comedy with... Uh, yeah, it's the comedy with Adam Sandler and Damian Wayans. Or Damon Wayans, excuse me. That was an interesting film. I haven't seen it in a while. Another film. He also directed uh, Blind Faith, Future Sport, Strange Justice, Our America. The last film he directed was in 06. It's called One for, for One Night. So he got work, but I wonder why he hasn't done anything lately. Let me check to make sure he's not dead, because if, he, if he's dead, that would explain that, but... I know he's still very much alive. Ah! Oh, that's why. He's been doing TV work. Apparently he's directed some episodes of The Walking Dead. He directed some episodes of Dexter. Uh, Stargate Universe. Law and Order. So it looks like he's mostly doing TV work now. So, Hey, he was a cinematographer on Tales from Dark Side. That's cool. He was also the cinematographer on other films like Malcolm X. Well, that's cool, at least he's getting some work. Now, this, the music was done by Edward uh, Shearmer, which, which fit the tone of the film. I thought not my favorite score, but it fit the tone. I did like it. It opened with a, well, like a rock song, and it's one I recognized. Hey, man, nice shot. I thought that was a, no, a nice film. Nice film opener. As for the acting, uh, William Sadler, he did a good job as our protagonist, uh, Breaker, with the... Of course, it's glad it's an actor I recognize. I didn't know who it, notice who it was at first, but then I look it up. I'm like, oh, that's who it is. Either they must have added the makeup they did made made him look older or something, but it worked. I thought he did an excellent job. Like, you don't know a lot about his past. The only part of his past you know is how he got the artifact in the first place, which I think works probably for the better. We don't know everything about him. It's better left up to the imagination, and he played the character very well. Of course, uh, he, other films he was in, he played Colonel Stewart in Die Hard 2. He was the Grim Reaper in Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. He was Haywood in The Shawshank Redemption. He played the Mummy the following year in Bordello of Blood. Uh, he was uh, Kloss in The Green Mile. And more recently he played, I almost said prayed. And more recently he played the President in Iron Man 3, which... Kind of funny considering... Uh, Considering that fellow Stephen King Illumini play the president and vice president, of course, Miguel Ferrer, you all know, everyone probably knows was in the stand. But, a little interesting though. So far, this pro it's hard to say if this or the colonel from Die Hard 2, my favorite character he's played, but they're very close. Uh, Billy Zane is our bad guy, the collector. He did a pretty good job, I thought. His character is over the top at times, but it came off to me like it kind of fit this type of character, like... Most characters we think of that are demonic, you know, are very serious. But it's kind of like if the, his character, it's not as over the top as the character I'm about to compare him to, but it's almost like if the Joker was a demon, if you think about it. Not that over the top, not as over the top as the Joker usually is, but I think you get my point. He's kind of like that. And of course, this wasn't his first film either. I mean, he was in Back to the Future as Match, as well as the sequel. He was in Tombstone as Mr. Fabian. Uh, he was in Posse as a Colonel Graham. He played uh, a character in Memphis Bell. Uh, the year after this movie came out, he was the title character in The Phantom, which is the other film that I know him from directly. Played a John, he voiced John Rolfe in Pocahontas 2. Um, uh, let's see, more recently he was in The Scorpion King 3. Is the king? Um, um, uh, a movie called I don't know if there's a movie or show, but it says Dark Star Hollow. Uh, TV work. He's done some TV movies as well, and is on an episode of The Deep End. I, I did not know that. According to this, he voiced. I'm guessing it's the dark version of the character, but he voiced Ansem in. Kingdom Hearts and Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories. That's very, very interesting. I did not know that. I'm guessing he voiced the dark version because it's only there, but I guess they replaced him for the sequel. Like they did a lot. But anyway. 
uh, Thomas Hayden Church as the character of Roach. I thought he did an interesting job for the character. I'm glad he didn't go with the stereotypical dude, you know, voice. Of course, uh, this apparently was his second movie. He was the year before, a couple years before he was in Tombstone. I know him mostly from George of the Jungle as our uh, pro as our antagonist, and of course he's one of the few actors who reprised their role in the sequel. <laughs> He was also in Spanglish, Monkey Bone. Comic fans know him, of course, from Spider-Man 3 as the Sandman, which I, didn't, I guess maybe it's because of how he cut his hair. I guess I didn't recognize him in that, but I'm not really surprised that that was him. And more recently than that, he was in John Carter. We Bought a Zoo, Aliens in the Attic. Uh, he currently is filming a movie called Heaven is for Real. But he's still getting work, too. I thought he was good in this role. Kind of brother, he, he was a jerk, but the right amount. I mean, when he slaps one of the characters, you're like, ooh, demons get him. So, I'm not going to say anything other than that, but your wish is my command. Jana Pinkett Smith. Off the top of my head, I can't really think of much of her work that I've seen. Of course, she filmed this movie back when she was just Jada, Jada Pinkett. At least that's what she's credited as. But, she did a very good job, I thought. Brought the right amount of smart aleckness to the beginning of the role, but then got more serious as time went along, so she grew up during the events of the film, which how the film ends, I guess you could say that works. Uh, before this, she was in uh, Menace to Society, uh, The Inkwell. Of course, after this, she was in The Nutty Professor, <laughs> Scream 2, in the cameo role. Uh, she voiced Toki in the English dub of Princess Mononoke, which... As an anime fan, I'm sorry I have to say this, but I have not seen that. Take me to your leader. Uh, she was also she also voiced Gloria in the Madagascar films, and she pl was in uh, the Matrix sequels. And that's about it. This was actually a pretty good performance by her, probably one of the, well, one of the better ones in the film. But thought she did a good job. Uh, CC. H. Uh, Pounder as Irene. She did a good job. Uh, she didn't go into that whole I'm a independent black woman that don't need no man thing, but she did a good job and glad to see she's still getting work. I mean, I know her from two films before this, one of uh, both of which are infamous depending on who you ask. She played Fran Ambrose in Psycho 4, and then of course the film she did before this that was released, or at least released why was wise was Robocop 3, where she was Bertha, which I guess that's where I recognize her from. Get back! The crane's gonna blow! <laughs> she did a better job here than she did in that. And she was also the Oracle in Aladdin and the King of Thieves? That actually surprises me. And more recently, she was an orphan as Sister Abigail. She voiced Amanda w Waller in Superman, Batman, Public Enemies. And I'm guessing, I think she also did the work on Justice League Unlimited. Yep, I was right, nine episodes. Had a feeling. And of course, she was in Avatar as Moat. I could be wrong, but isn't that the uh, main uh, Navi character's mother? I don't know. Uh, of course, um, Brenda Bakke is Cordella. She's not in the film that long, but f what she has, she did a decent job. You can understand why she does the thing that she does, but. Especially with her profession and how the person treats her, but. They did a good job. Before this, she was in Hot Shop Part Dukes. Or Deuce, how you pronounce it. A couple episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation. Um, let's see. After this film, she was in Under Siege 2, American Gothic. An episode of Charmed. An episode of CSI. Uh, the Mentalist. And NYPD Blue. Uh, so she's still got some work. Uh, Dick Miller played the character of Uncle Willie, which his character is just fun to watch, especially with what happens to him at the end. He's still with us, despite his age. Um, he's uh, been in films like uh, Piranha, The Howling. He was the gun shop clerk in The Terminator. He was also in Gremlins and Night of the Creeps, Chopping Mall, uh, Dead Heat, Gremlins 2. Ah. Oh. That's interesting. He was the voice of Chucky Soul in Batman Mask of the Phantasm. Why I didn't recognize that, I don't know. Well, then again, his character is such a small one, but he's the first one off. I want you, Chucky boy. And after this, he's only made two other movies. 
Small Soldiers and the Hole, which both of which are directed by Joe Dante, the <laughs> director of uh, both Gremlins movies, so I guess that's why. wonder why he hasn't done any other movies other than that. Maybe he's just happy with retirement, or maybe he just doesn't want to do any other movies. I don't know. Other actors in the movie, we've got Gary Farmer as the deputy, uh, Charles Flesher as another character named Wally, uh, Ryan O. Donahue as the kid Danny, and then other other actors. The rest of them did a good job. If I went through all of them, I'd be here for another five minutes, but I'm just going to go through all of them. They all did a good job. Well, since I'm on, the, on it, I might as well see what else our Crypt Keeper voice actor has done. This is probably his biggest claim to fame. Uh, Let's see. Uh, it says here something about Three Stooges. Uh, I'll never look that. Oh, he voiced the Adam in a Justice League of America pilot. Looks like he's done mostly voice work and all that. Uh, he was Buster Bunny in four Tiny Toons cartoons. He did a voice work in America Tale, The Treasure of Manhattan Island, episode of Ben 10, uh, uh, Metal Gear Rising. Oh, he was crazy Smurf in the Smurfs. That's kind of funny. And then, of course, he was in Jack the Giant Sailor. Sailor. I almost said Sailor. I was going to say Sailor. I mean, Slayer is one of the giant heads, so he's still getting work. Anyway, in conclusion, this is a fun horror film. Uh... Well produced for a twelve million dollar budget in the nineties. I mean, if it had a little bit more money, it could have been a little bit better. But for what it is, it works, and it just shows the right amount of what we need to know. Because you know the whole thing of what's in your mind can be more powerful than what's shown on screen, and this is an instance of where that works, though in a different manner than what normally. It's not like with the kill; it's more with like a lot of the plot elements and all that. It just gives you enough to know, and then the rest of it is up to the viewer to decide, which I think is it works. Uh, my rating for the film, hmm. personally, I have to say probably four out of five stars. If you're a fan of the show or a fan of horror films, I'd say give it a watch.